So we went from hearing about cybercrime this morning, um, learned a lot about robots, and uh, went from there to smart factories. Now we went to some type of smart home that helps us sleep much better. Um, we had Pepper on on our stage, a robot. Um, we had unicorns, at least like the idea of unicorns here up on stage. Next up on stage, we will have what you probably call cyborgs. Um, we'll have a couple of pretty human kind looking people um, that do have technology in their bodies. Um, and they're still discussing. So I, I very quick introduce them to you. Uh, first, First of them is Amal. He's kind of the pioneer of the do-it-yourself RFID implant implantation movement. So he's the one. Do we need that? He's the one that uh, brings RFID implantation to your uh, kitchen table, probably. With him is Patrick Kama. He's the founder of Digiwell, Smart Up Your Life. Um, what I thought was most interesting about him, he's a member of the German Cyborg Club. Um, and he is doing a lot with biohacking and digital lifestyle. He's a consultant for digital lifestyle. And with them, as far as I know, is Rick. Uh, Rick had been up on our stage yesterday talking about virtual reality. Um, now it's going to be not virtual at all. There will be blood. Um, because he will be here live on stage, he'll get an implant, RFID chip implanted into his hand. This is why we build up the camera setting here, so you can see what happens uh, up there on the screen. So if you've eaten just now, and you're kind of not so happy about seeing blood, you might not want to watch it or bring it back um, if you need to throw up. Um, I hope it's not going to be too bloody. So, welcome on stage, Amal, Patrick, and uh, is Rick coming right away? We'll do it at the end. Uh, oh, you do that, I do. So, um, no. you didn't tell me any dirty secret about you, but you showed me yeah, one. Yeah. Will you talk about that? I will in the talk. Okay, so we will not reveal that for the moment, so the stage is yours. All right, cool. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, so... Uh, the talk is about cyborgs and the rise of biohacking. And uh, really, if you're wondering what biohacking is, it's, uh, it's really a subset of different technologies and different approaches at improving uh, human, human life and humanity. Uh, everything from body and mind hacking to 3D bioprinting, like printing cellular structures and uh, collagen structures, tissues, organs, uh, to DNA and RNA hacking, which is like changing the software of life itself. Uh, and then there's kind of all the way on the other side, DIY uh, grinding, which is kind of what uh, I'm into, which is uh, essentially directly upgrading the body uh, by implanting devices into it. Uh, you can see how kind of uh, these different subsets of biohacking flow into quantified self, life extension and enhancement and the singularity, then down into transhumanism. Uh, so transhumanism is uh, simply an international movement with the goal of fundamentally transforming the human condition. Um, that can't be said any simpler than that. So when you think about the human body, the traditional approach to that is that, you know, you are your body, your body is you. And there's some kind of like sacred aspect to, to, to that. There's a, there's a skin barrier and, uh, and you, your concept of self is, is your entire physical being. But uh, biohackers think of the body as more of a sport utility vehicle for the brain. Uh, we think of ourselves as our minds, and our bodies are just these really great tools uh, to experience the world and to interact with it. Uh, and just like an SUV, we want to go better, faster, stronger, uh, and, and add upgrades. So since the beginning of, of time, really, uh, we've been tool users. Uh, not much has changed. We, we're still kind of uh, monkeys with better tools. Uh, and, and so really, the, the idea of improving yourself is nothing new. We've we used these external machines to try to improve our functionality as human beings. Um, we're now doing that with wearables, so um, devices that we wear, devices that we carry, smartphones, things like this. Um, the problem is that they usually end up in the drawer. Uh, they're used for a time and then they end up uh, not being used. And the reason for that, I think, is something I'm calling the Tomagotchi effect, which is 
really, uh, if you remember the Tomagotchis, they were from like the 90s or, or earlier. They were little toys that you had to manage the, and the little uh, virtual digital pets. And you had to uh, pull it out of your pocket every few minutes and feed it or, or care for it. And if you didn't, they would die. And uh, we have those today. They're smartphones and other devices that need battery charging and, and signal and get what's the Wi-Fi password. So you have all these kind of management details you have to you know, use throughout the day. And so you, know, you have this effort versus benefit. And, and in the end of the day, a lot of these devices don't meet that uh, requirement and they end up in the drawer. So out of the, uh, these Tomagachis that we have with us today, there's three main ones. There's the keys, wallet, and phone. And these are so critical that people have made doormats uh, so that you don't leave the house without checking for keys, wallet, and phone. They're the three you know, critical things that we use in society today. Um, so it got me thinking about the key. This was back in 2005. Uh, I had a whole bunch of keys, and uh, I was managing these keys, and I, I thought, man, uh, these keys have been around since like 700 BC, and the lock and key hasn't changed much since then. Uh, there's got to be a better way. And uh, so I thought about biometrics. You know, I wanted the door to just know that it was me and just open. And the problem is that uh, biometrics then and still today, particularly for outdoor environments, they're not very uh, robust. Uh, they're expensive, kind of clunky. Um, iris scanning technology, well, uh, that's an era uh, of the day, and it was also pretty ridiculous. I mean, that was a multi-thousand dollar unit. You put it outside, and some kid hits it, and now you can't get in your door. So um, the other thing that I didn't like about biometrics is that your body is not a secure token. Uh, you leave these identifiers everywhere, and uh, it's not really actual security, uh, as demonstrated by uh, the Secretary of Defense here. So uh, she was actually targeted and, uh, uh, by a hacker out of the Chaos Computing Club here in Germany. Uh, they were able to recreate her thumbprint from multiple high-res photos downloaded off the internet and then taken personally. And, uh, and then presented, oh, I'm missing that slide. Anyway, they presented it uh, to the reader and they were able to impersonate her at a secure government facility. Um, so that's not cool. Um, so the idea in my mind was RFID. It's robust, it's cheap, it works. Um, the only problem is I didn't want to exchange my metal keys for plastic cards. Um, so I got thinking about the small implants that pets have been getting for identification purposes. You know, the pets here in the EU, most of the EU states are required uh, to get these implants, and it's to identify the pet and the pet owner. Uh, I thought, okay, well, that's really cool, but I don't want to use the pet implant. Uh, I want to find a, a different chip type and different protocol. Um, but I did find that chip, and so I used a pet injector. This is actually an injector that has a pet chip in it. Uh, we threw the pet chip away after and added a sterilized uh, EM tag, which is a type of tag. Uh, and then my family doctor uh, did the installation. So we talked it over and, uh, and he said, okay, well, um, you know, women get uh, uh, female birth control uh, implants and they're quite large and they're injected within a syringe. So this should be no problem. And, and he was able to do that uh, very easily. So this is uh, me now uh, using my implant to unlock my door. And that's my primary use is uh, you know, access control. I'm happy, no keys. Um, so I've re essentially replaced my, my key management burden with an implant that I don't have to think about or manage, and it just goes away, and I think about it about as much as I think about my kidneys, um, which is good. Uh, back in 2005, that was a big deal, so there was some media hype, and, uh, and a, a publishing company wanted me to write a book called uh, Extreme uh, Toys or RFID Toys, and so I did some projects. I made a keyboard you could log into the computer with. Uh, you can see it's Windows XP. It's, again, 2005. Um, so I was able to log in with just wave my hand over the keyboard. Uh, Fire Safe, you can take a part of digital safe and add RFID authentication to it. So I'm able to access the safe with my implant. Uh, and then this is me accessing my car. So I can just get into my trusty Volkswagen. And uh, after that, things kind of cooled off. There wasn't much uh, activity going on. The media hype died down. Uh, but then something happened. Uh, 2008 or 9, the maker revolution happened. and. Uh, people started building things again. They started making electronics and going in their garage and, and uh, experimenting. And this resulted in quite a large number of people getting interested in an implanted RFID tag. So I started answering emails after email after email, and eventually it got away from me. It just couldn't um, answer them all, and then people were finding their own solutions online uh, or just like making assumptions and buying or sourcing just unsafe devices and then just putting them in their body any old way. Um, so this is a little section of the bad part uh, of biohacking uh, back in the 2009-ish. Um, so people were uh, willingly going about home surgery, 
And uh, this is an example, a bad example, of somebody doing that in a really unguided, um, stupid way. And so uh, I decided that it's probably, oh, and this is a, this is a transponder example. It's, a, it's inside of a key, and most keys have these transponders inside them. Um, it's a Texas Instrument chip and all this, but it's not safe for implantation, but people were just taking it out and sticking it in their bodies. Uh, so bad things. Uh, so I decided to start a, a company, Dangerous Things, uh, with the goal of first supplying safe material so we know that the devices we're selling are safe, they're biosafe, um, and then uh, we ended up with what's called the X-Series implantable transponders. Um, <coughs> these things were cytotoxicity tested, so we, we went through the whole gamut of testing. Uh, we did crush tests on them, we wanted to see how, how much pressure it would take to break uh, this glass tag because people are not pets and uh, we do things with our hands. So <clears throat> we were able to crush it completely, and, uh, and the tag was uh, resilient. Uh, then we said, OK, we're going to put it in a piece of chicken. Uh, we're going to do this uh, crush test in a, like a, a human analog. Uh, so we crushed it and uh, destroyed the chicken, but the tag was uh, OK. It was unharmed. And we've, we realized that after maxing out the machine, uh, the human body and tissues in general will, will move and ply around, and the glass is more rigid than the tissue. So while it's outside of the body, it's very brittle. But inside a tissue, it's uh, resilient. So we also threw it into a vacuum chamber that's more vacuum than the uh, vacuum of outer space, and it survived just fine. Uh, we also threw it in a doer of uh, liquid nitrogen just for fun and took it out and tested it. It was great. Um, the other thing uh, about Dangerous Things is we partner, because uh, if you buy something that's safe, but you're still doing it yourself, that's a bad, bad idea. So we partner with professional body piercers. Uh, we had talked to doctors, medical doctors, but uh, most medical doctors are interested in restorative medicine to bring you to normal, and this is considered elective or augmentative. Uh, so they weren't really interested. And as the doctors that did participate, they didn't really read our instructions, and they kind of did it badly. Um, but professional piercers are great because they understand needlework, they understand skin, aseptic procedure, and they're professionals, and they're licensed. So out of that, we built a partner network, and it's still growing today. So these are partners in and around Germany and the EU, um, and it's growing every day, uh, places where our customers can go to get it installed safely. Another thing happened. Uh, NFC came on the scene and became ubiquitous in smartphones. So we actually ended up, uh, you know, we couldn't source an NFC compliant tag, so we ended up manufacturing one. And we did that through Indiegogo. We crowdfunded the manufacturing, and we raised four times the goal, uh, which was a surprise to me. I didn't think that there was that much interest, but apparently there, there was. So, uh, it was really great to see that response and, and people's interest in, in the technology. This is the XNT here. Uh, it's the uh, same type of glass tube in an injector. It's sterilized in EO gas and it's good to go. So today this is a uh, map of sales. So we, we sell a lot in Australia and the uh, and, uh, US, uh, a lot into Brazil uh, and throughout the EU and Russia. So it's, uh, it's quite a, a global phenomenon. It's not just localized. Um, so we also sell through our partner Digiwell. So this is uh, in Germany here. Digiwell is the only authorized partner to sell uh, these products in the EU. And uh, they have great guides and uh, how to actually use it. It's in German, so if you speak German, that's a good thing. Um, they have uh, interesting like, how-to guides and all kinds of stuff. So it's definitely uh, good to partner with people who speak other languages than English, because that seems to be a problem. Uh, the other thing is interesting is the Declaration of Conformity. So uh, we actually had to go through, Digiwell went through a process with the government of Germany to actually get them approved and prove their safety. And, and uh, so they're the only people that were actually authorized to sell any kind of implant like this. Uh, so with the popularity, this, we started to get some celebrities. This is Peter Diamond is. He's kind of a big deal in some circles. And, uh, so he's getting it done on stage as he's talking. Um, and with the popularity growth, there's started to be other applications built uh, about this kind of thing. So uh, Bitcoin is another application that people have been exploring about putting on uh, the implant. So this is a, a project by a customer of ours, Patrick. It's his BioPay project. So he's reading his implant and it's authorizing a Bitcoin payment. And there you go. He's been able to make a payment with his implant. There are uh, <coughs> also other people building uh, hardware around this platform. Uh, this is an example of a payment terminal that also reads NFC tags. Uh, and that's an example of reading a Bitcoin wallet uh, you know, balance. So it's made a payment, displays a balance. This is another uh, customer of ours that worked with Scandinavian Airlines. 
uh, he was able actually to work with them to put his boarding pass information onto his implant, and then he would go to the airport and get out of the, uh, the VIP section there. And without any paperwork at all, he just presents his tag, and he's allowed to board. So <clears throat> another uh, uh, aspect of, of kind of gaining popularity is um, uh, companies like Kaspersky put on a, a whole event where they had a piercer come in and do installations uh, of this thing. And it's interesting because um, Kaspersky is involved in security. And that's one of the key um, kind of critical uh, components of, of, uh, of this technology is what is the security? People want to know if they're not giving up privacy and they don't have any security issues. Um, the problem is that um, security, and particularly cryptography, needs electricity, it needs power. So the computing components inside the chip require a lot of energy. And the way that works is uh, these, these devices are passive, meaning they just have a chip and an inductive coil. So they don't have a battery, and what happens is you present that tag to a reader, and it pulls power from a magnetic field that's generated by the reader. Um, the shape and size of that uh, antenna in the tag is how much energy is going to be transferred. So if you look on the right there, that's a typical glass tube type antenna, but the problem is most antennas that are in readers and phones are flat, and the type of uh, coupling that happens between them is not very good. So we decided to take a look at a flat uh, architecture tag. So this is uh, where we had to get into polymer research because um, the typical technology of you know, decades ago where pets were getting these things in glass tube isn't going to work for us anymore. So we wanted to uh, start innovating. So our first attempt failed. That's, uh, that's a tag that was here in my right hand and this finger. And that was there for about two months, and then it uh, ended up failing. So we did some analysis on it and ended up innovating, uh, kind of iterating through. This is the second generation tag. And so the idea was to put this into my left hand, and it's actually been installed. So that just takes a small scalpel cut and some sutures, and you're good to go. So through all this uh, popularity, and you'll have to forgive me, I've <coughs> contracted a little throat problem, but uh, <coughs> through all this popularity, the, uh, the, the different partnerships and people that we're talking to has grown, and one of those partners is Fidesmo. So Fidesmo makes uh, a card that uh, has basically a platform on it that you can load applications, and those applications can be for cryptography or for ticketing or transit or any of those things. Um, we really liked this idea, so we said, hey, can we put that card into an implant form factor? Can we get something like that with advanced cryptography and uh, advanced uh, you know, like micro-application support into an implant? Uh, and I'm happy to say that we were able to do that. Uh, this is the Yuki. Um, the idea is that it's a, an implantable NFC platform for security, payment, and cryptography applications. Um, that's my dirty secret that I was talking about. I have a prototype in my arm uh, that we can t show off afterward. But uh, the idea, uh, fundamentally, is to take and merge your digital identity uh, with your biological identity. It's something that is today very loosely coupled. Uh, you, you have your, your digital identity, which is protected by passwords and uh, you know, account names and things like this. But the problem with that is um, the, the uh, accounts are easily compromised, and your identity really, truly rests with the account holder, not with you. So for example, if somebody were to get into your Facebook account, send a message to somebody, that person's going to assume that it's you. And Facebook owns your identity in that sense. Uh, the same thing is true of a bank. So, you log into your banking system, you want to transfer some money, um, it just takes some simple uh, identifiers to do that, and then the bank acts on your behalf. Uh, but with the future of uh, you know, personal identity in a cryptographic proof, the idea that you can merge biology with your identity online is that the bank could not transfer money unless you signed that transaction. So the bank would create the transaction, give it to you, and you would actually authorize and sign it cryptographically. Send it back to the bank, that bank could then transfer the funds, put the, the transaction into the blockchain ledger, uh, but it's you that made that transaction, not the bank. And that's just a fundamental shift in how identity works and will work, I think, online. Um, so this is an example of the Yuki. Oh, I wonder if it's going to play. Can we? Yeah, OK. So this is a, an example of uh, um, one-time passwords. So I'm logging into a website. It's asking for a one-time password. Oh, it's going to go. So I take my phone, I place it over the prototype, 
I get my one-time password, which is generated inside the prototype, not on the device, which is critical because uh, your, your phone could be compromised. And uh, if you're generating keys on your phone, a hacker could easily get, get that information. So that's an example there. And let's see if it's going to play. So this is a PGP file decryption. And I might have to see if it's going to play here. So again, just like uh, protecting your, your personal information or your accounts online, you can protect actual data. Um, I'm hoping this will play. Is it something you have to hit to make it play? Yeah. OK. So this is just an example of um, decrypting information with uh, um, the Yuki, if it will work. Maybe not. Oh, well. Now you can see the end result there. I decrypted a text file with my uh, Yuki implant. So that's really the talk. And uh, I think we're going to ask for a volunteer if anybody's interested in getting an implant done here on stage. The, the microchips have been there 20, 30 years. Why these advanced applications are coming in only now? I think that has to do with um, uh, basically somebody being crazy enough to, to make it a human application. Um, I, I named the company Dangerous Things kind of as a joke because people thought like what I had done was so dangerous when it's really not dangerous at all. Um, but uh, it really, it just comes down to the idea that uh, people being comfortable with the, with the concept of putting a functional device, a non-medical functional device inside their body for this application, for this purpose. Um, it just hasn't been something anybody's ever really thought about before. So how do you get it out if you want to <laughs> get rid of it? So that, that's a good question. And uh, you know, animal implants uh, for pets and things, they have a coating on the glass called BioBond. And it's porous. And it's, it's meant for your tissue to grow into it and lock it in place. And the reason that is is there's untrained veterinary assistants like grabbing animals and just jamming it in there. Uh, we do it very carefully and smartly. And so we don't want or need that coating. Uh, so uh, because we don't have the coating, it's very easy to remove. You simply go to the doctor, any general practice doctor, and you put a glove on. and you poke your hand here, and you poke here, and it, put, it basically kicks the end up, and they just make a small incision, comes out. I've had three or four in and out. This is my project hand, so it's very easy. Are there any disadvantages? Uh, for example, as a customer, um, they can say, oh, that's not allowed to bring in our country. Uh, sorry? So, ich sag das mal auf Deutsch. Kann es irgendwelche Probleme geben am Zoll, are there any problems with customs? Ah, um, <clears throat> so this is, uh, it might be a little touchy. There's no problems with airports. Uh, it's MRI compatible. And customs doesn't know it's there unless you declare it. And in a, th this is where it gets interesting. Because with the, the Yuki, where you're generating cryptography keys, you can protect your email or correspondence or data with, with cryptography. And in some jurisdictions, you might be required to give up that security information. But if it's here, it's essentially covert. Um, so they wouldn't know about it. Um, and so that brings up questions of like, personal data sovereignty, uh, particularly in the EU, where personal identification and privacy is merged very tightly with data privacy. So in countries like the US, there's uh, um, a little less of that. So it's, uh, some people are, are looking at it for being able to have true kind of data protection. Current customers fly regularly to Israel. It's right. probably the hardest custom security you can imagine in the world, and they have no problems. Yeah, and unless they declare it. Um, otherwise, it's unnoticed. Uh, the magnetic spin tomograph, are there any problems with MRT? No. Uh, it's been certified up to seven Tesla, uh, but it's been tested uh, uh, up to 13. So very, very strong MRT. Any other questions? Yeah. Would it be possible that somebody, that some villains will read your microchip without your knowing it and uh, they copy the information and make a duplicate? Sure. So. When you're talking about uh, like a traditional RFID tag, um, an attacker is going to set up shop usually in like a public space. 
uh, either they want to attack like a contactless payment card or they want to get into a particular building. And so uh, the scenario is typically that uh, let's say somebody wants to collect credit card data. And so they sit in a train station or somewhere and they, they get information from random people coming by. That's okay for them because you don't have to know, the attacker doesn't have to know the person to use that data. They know that it's credit card payment data, they can go right out and use it uh, and, and commit fraud. But in a personal use context for like say accessing your home, if, a, if an attacker was able to somehow do that, uh, there's no context for the information they've gained. Um, so they're essentially just left with a number and they don't know what it means or where it's used or how it's used. Um, but in the next generation tags, like the Yuki, uh, it's fully cryptographically protected. So it's, there's no chance of getting any meaningful information from it unless you already have uh, like a pin code that you can activate the device. Uh, but old, old technology is susceptible to that. Uh, but it come, the risk comes down to use case. Um, so if you're an employee at a bank and somebody wants in the bank and there's, every employee has an old RFID card, access card, then the attacker can stand by the door of the bank and again, they don't need to know you, they just need to know that any employee going in and out, I can grab. Um, so again, Yuki would help with that scenario and be fully uh, secure interaction with the bank door. Any more questions? I think we nope. are All right. through. Maybe we're going to get to stab. And you want to see now a live installation? Oh, you have a question? I would like to have the access to my house. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> why, why this uh, microchip thing uh, is, is better than fingerprint identification? Sure. So <clears throat> fingerprints are, are not really secure. They're left everywhere and even left on the sensor of the door. Uh, it's been shown time and time again that uh, going up to even the sensor where you place your fingerprint, your, your fingerprints left an impression on the sensor. So there's been multiple attacks made where, again, they don't need to know you or access. They just place uh, material, like um, even a saline bag, over the sensor, and it uses the old impression of the fingerprint and allows access. Um, the other thing is that fingerprint readers are expensive, and they're fuzzy. They're not very accurate. Um, and if you place it outdoors for like external door access, it's very easily damaged. So it's not uh, a very robust technology, in my opinion. Okay. I think we had an, somebody who was going to get, yes, that's right. So, so now the bloody part starts. Do you want to see that? <laughs> do we have a scissors or do I? Yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, come on up. So we had a medical check beforehand, so that everything is fine with them. Let's go ahead and We're have not a doing seat implants there. under 18 or yeah. people who have problems with blood uh, clotting or something like this. You're doing your right so hand. So he's left checked, hand. he's certified, right and hand um, hand. we're going to show now online basically how we actually set this uh, syringe and get turn him into a okay. cyborg. I'll go ahead and move your chair over this way. Perfect. All right. Go ahead and put your hands in your lap. So now you need to decide which hand do you want to use. Do you want to use your left or your right hand for this? Um, a lot of people have two implants, three implants. Yesterday we had a customer, he had four implants. So um, yeah, you can see that. Okay, go ahead and move your hands to your lap. So the most important part now, of course, is sterility. Um, so that's why now it takes a little while until the actual syringe is getting in there to make everything sterile and um, yeah you, you, you can it takes like three four five more minutes until we are at that stage where the needle gets in okay go ahead and put your hand right there so now the cloth underneath is sterile and um, so we are now Amal is going to look now for a good spot just taking out all the equipment that he needs. Amal, how many have you done so far? I think probably close to 400. 400, so he knows what he's doing.
We had customers always come to the question, is it really painful? Yesterday we had customers saying yes, oh, I hope so. And then they ask for, can you do it really slowly? <laughs> But we also have customers who say, oh, that's it, I didn't feel anything. Or sometimes they go, ouch. But usually what burns a little bit afterwards is a disinfection. That's all. An earring, I was told, is, is worse because you go in and you go out there. And this one is just a syringe and just a needle. So now he's sort of making everything sterile. And then it needs to dry a little bit, otherwise it's, it's too slippy to grab the skin in a, in a good way. <clears throat> okay, when it's now dry, Amal is now testing where the bones to get a good parallel shot in it. And it's not as bad as it looks, believe me. As long as the needle is still covered with plastic, you know, there's no action. <laughs> so now it's drying off the fluid. It's now looking for the right spot. Ready? Okay. When you get it, you want to breathe in, and when you breathe out and relax, you get it in. So you don't really, you don't really feel it. So now it's the moment of truth. That's it. Now it's a little bit. Every person, it's a bit different. Some don't bleed at all. Others a little bit more. But that's just now a matter of personal body, I would, I don't know. That's it. Now he's a cyborg already. He's permanently wearing electronics basically in his body. Yeah, big love, applause. Well done. Yeah, it, it, how was they it? didn't really how was it that much. It's like uh, uh, a normal syringe uh, or getting your blood out. It's did you look when he did it? Uh, no. <laughs> I never look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he told us before he's a little bit of skeptical with needles, but something. But um, it was okay. Yeah. And yeah. now the next two, three hours, he should really press hard on it so it really stops. He should not um, wash his hands for the next one day or something. Yeah. Don't do the dishes tonight, you know, with your, with your hand and the old dishwash water. Um, and be a little bit careful for the next two weeks. Don't do, you know, like a kickbox match tomorrow or don't play volleyball. Um, but after two weeks, it's like the swelling is out and then it's fine. And after like a couple of months, you don't feel it anymore at all. Well done, guys. Cool. Amal, how was it? It was, it was fine. I mean, everybody, everybody's different. So he's going to have a little bit of a bruise, but uh, it'll go away in a couple of days. Yes, uh, before you did it to uh, Colin and Jonathan, yeah. they work with me, and they didn't bleed at all, so I'm a bit skeptical that they're human. <laughs> <laughs> so now I could prove uh, with the camera that I'm... You're that, I, sure. that I did bleed. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to hold it's, it a bit longer yeah. on your hand, yeah. Yeah, he's a, he is bleeding now a little bit, but that's uh, just a matter of minutes, then that's over. And um, then he gets a good plaster, and that's it. Then he is a cyborg. <laughs> yeah, it would have been boring without blood. Anyone who wants to see this <laughs> more closely, <laughs> we do this in our booth here in the loft area. Later on, we have a happy hour where a customer get, can get shipped. And um, I think for the next, at 4 o'clock, I think we have already like 12 people um, lined up. It's absolutely phenomenal what we see here at Seabit, how we see this here. 
Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of uh, the, the the request is, is just yeah. phenomenal. Uh, I mean, we thought we do two three per day. Yeah. I think in average we have like twenty now. Um, it's a big interest. Any more questions to the to the guys upstairs or in general? <laughs> Are you all speechless and all? <laughs> okay, well done. Bit of cleaning. Yeah, I'm really. Do you have the other plaster as well? No, um, that's not. You'll, we'll go over to the booth and get them. Okay, well, you get to the booth and you get another yeah. one. Okay. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to use it, like for um, opening doors and stuff like that. For identification, yeah. right? Or you, to have your business card on it? Just press on it. Cool. And we'll go get another Band-Aid over there. My, my question would be, is like, what kind of information do people normally, s uh, like most of the people, have on the chip? Um, it's a good question. It's yeah. like the question we get like every minute, basically. <laughs> um, there are two parts in the chip. The one is the RFID part with a serial number, and the other one is the NFC part. So if you have like a normal, um, hang on. A normal smartphone, you have like apps on there. They are like free, and um, so when it comes to how did you get the information on it, you can just say, okay, I want my business card on it. You, you click business card, put your details on it, put it to your hand, and say right, and then it's on. Um, other other things is f your social media profiles. A lot of stuff you can do with your phone actually. Or you have for for um, fitness gym access. We have clients um, starting their motorcycle or access to the car. What we saw in the video. I personally have my business card on my hand and um, have access to my house. I don't need keys anymore. So it's very individual what you do actually with it. What's the weirdest? What's the weirdest kind of information you've heard of that people store on the NFC? Good question. Um, like what, for instance? I don't know. I think starting your motorcycle is actually a pretty fun thing to have, right? It's, well, what there's, I, I heard, uh, maybe Amal, you would know better. I heard in America there are weapons that you can only fire when you have your, your RFID reader to it. I heard about that. Huh? It's a wristband, but... Oh, boring. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, guys. That was um, that was even more fun than having Pepper around, um, because Pepper would show no blood. <laughs>